You're listening to the Arts Unknown Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Rocco. If you're a first-time listener, welcome to the show. If you're a returning listener, well then welcome back. On today's episode, I got a chance to chat with Zach Fearman. Zach has had a successful career as a professional touring drummer and audio engineer. From cutting his teeth in Boston's experimental rock scene to supporting major label recording artists in Nashville, Zach has spent well over a decade playing clubs, festivals, concert halls, and arenas all over the world. He now spends his time in the North Shore of Boston, teaching music and playing regionally. I had an awesome time getting a chance to chat with Zach about what it was like to tour with a professional band and what invaluable lessons he learned from life on the road. Let's take a listen. Today, my guest is Zach Fearman. Zach, welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, man? Thanks for having me, dude. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming on. <clears throat> of course. Um, so we want people to get to know you and your journey through music. So why don't we start at the very beginning? Sure. Uh, what's your first musical memory? Wow. First first musical memory ever of me performing, I'm guessing? Anything. No, it's, it's supposed to be very vague. Oh, like wow. Maybe okay. first uh, song you heard that really inspired you i mean you can go as far back as you can remember <laughs> well my here. dad always my dad always says uh when i when my mom was pregnant with me he mm-hmm. put uh headphones on her belly and oh, really? played in into the womb so he's he's always like you've been listening to zeppelin since before you were born so zeppelin <laughs> zeppelin's a big one okay. um but yeah i remember yeah probably my first um was definitely zeppelin with my dad i don't know if i remember exactly i remember okay. vividly being very young and having him play uh, Freebird in the car, <laughs> really? Okay, <laughs> and jamming that's out. a long one. Too. It is, and I remember, yeah, I remember being really little, being like, "Dad, this song's really boring." He's like, "Just wait, just wait, <laughs> just wait." And then, yeah. like, they started rocking out, and I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" Hey, there we go. Do you yeah. remember how old you were? At that I point? was probably like three or four. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was pretty young, you know. That, mm-hmm. that one definitely sticks out. Nice. It was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And yeah. then um, I should have introduced you a little bit more. You are a drummer yes. and also an audio engineer. Yes. Is that correct? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm guessing at some point you took drum lessons. Is that right? Yeah. Um, okay, bring us back to that time. So I had a little, little like baby kit when I was probably about four or five. Oh, wow. Okay. And That's I did. Pretty young. It was really young, but I didn't start taking lessons until I was. Uh, I think I was 10. I might have been 9. Okay. I'm pretty sure I was 10. Okay. Um, and I'll paint us a little bit of a picture of scene. Uh, where did you grow up? So I grew up in Northeast Ohio, right near Cleveland, okay. Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and the listeners can't see this, but you got a nice Ohio <laughs> oh, shirt. Oh, yeah, I do. I on a very that. rock and roll kind of <laughs> font there. Where did you get that? I got that in Columbus, Ohio, on the road, okay. actually. Nice. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up um, in this like small, nice little town called Hudson, Ohio. Okay. Um, and they had a really, fortunately, a really good music program nice. that was like very well funded, and like mm-hmm. lots of kids were into it. Um, that helps very much. So, um, so I started in the school programs there. Like in, mm-hmm. I think it was fourth grade. I started playing violin while I was taking drum lessons because I knew I wanted to be a drummer. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Now, why did you start on violin? Because in for whatever reason in grade school they wouldn't let you st- there was no you had to be in the orchestra there was no okay. like trumpet or anything you had to be interesting strings for whatever reason that's interesting because so a lot of schools don't have orchestra a lot of them is band that's or exactly chorus, right maybe it's it was very strange okay. so I was like oh, okay I guess I have to play it I'll play violin right then fifth grade I tested uh, into percussion because I wanted to be a drummer right 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 and then from there it was like you know concert band there are jazz bands I was into and mm-hmm. then once I got into high school it was like percussion ensemble and all that, all that stuff, stuff. Too. now let's back up a second you said you knew you wanted to be a drummer any yeah. reason or what was there some thing that got you in there did you hear john bonham yep yeah. absolutely okay. i mean bonham is is Big still influence. my favorite drummer of all time really oh okay. yeah very much nice. so i hit the nail on the head with yeah that one. <laughs> he did. Um, among others but i mean yeah he's my favorite but i mean it was it was a handful of things it was definitely growing up listening to good music in my parents house they always had like rock mm-hmm. and roll and jazz around um okay. my uncle who is no longer with us he was a very talented um Guitar player and singer, he played for years. Nice. And he he was very supportive in my mu- musical career growing up and stuff. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I just I always knew I wanted to be a drummer. I I don't know exactly just one what of those it was. things. Yeah, it just it always appealed to me, and I was like, yeah. yeah, I have to do that. Were you a loud kid, Zach? 
Kind of, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay, you can be honest. I'm an allowed, I'm allowed adult, so yeah. I mean, yeah, it was definitely translates a, through the years. Yeah, but just like every other kid that's a drummer, you know, pots and pans when you're little. Yeah, you yep. My parents always tell a story. My my that that same uncle, mm-hmm. I was really young. I was a baby, um, and he was he would sing, and he said I was like patting out on his arm. Um, the tempo, and then he was really? like, "What?" And then he would he started to speed up, and he said, "I was like speeding up with really? him." Really? No yeah. way! You got yeah. the tempo changes. Uh-huh. I was like a little like I was a baby, and I was like nine months or something. There and my parents go. were like, "Huh?" It's destiny yeah. at that point, That's right? Right. Yeah. Or the innate ability. The genes were there. It son of must like. have been. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so you knew you wanted to be a drummer. Yeah. Um, you finally got a chance to move away from violin and, and <laughs> yeah. drums. Um, like one year. What about lessons? Did you ever get any lessons on the drums? Yeah. So I, when I was. About 10, I studied with this one guy. I don't really remember his name. It was just Mm -hmm. kind of this brief intro to drums. And then Mm -hmm. through the school, they had, once once I was in fifth grade, they had Mm -hmm. band and stuff, but it was also drum instruction on like technique and things like that. Oh, okay. Paradiddles and all that stuff. Totally, yep. Get your rudiments. I'm not a drummer, but that's the one fancy (laughs) drum word I know. Oh, yeah. We had to learn paradiddles and all those things. And then when I got into... Middle school, I started studying, um, I think it was late middle school, it was like eighth grade. Mm-hmm. This guy, um, I assume he's still playing in the Cleveland area. His name's Mark Gonder. Um, and okay. he, he was kind of like the guy for, um, at that point in your musical career, it's a lot of jazz, you know, jazz mm-hmm. band and things. Yep. So he was like the guy for drum set. Okay. And nice. I studied with him all throughout high school. Um, nice. Okay. So at least a good four years of drum lessons yeah. under your belt. And it was mostly drum kit stuff with him. You know, mm-hmm. like I took a little bit of xylophone and things that I, that I hated, but yeah. Mark. What was it about the auxiliary percussion? Or that's not auxiliary, I guess. It was, yeah, it was like like similar. classical percussion. Sure. You yeah, know, yeah. like timpani and all that. I just sure. didn't. It was just a little too square for me. I was yeah. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't care about this, man. I want to rock out. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, what was your experience like uh, being a student at that time? Um, Did you have a positive experience? As, as a music student? Yeah, well, uh, specifically uh, with the drum teacher. Sure. Um, yes. It was, I and honestly, still to this day, and we can get into this if you want, you know, further down the road in this conversation, sure. but I've never, I, I had a good experience with that high school teacher. Okay. He definitely opened my eyes to some things like, like African rhythms and like, nice. you know, just improvisation in general, which was very useful. Mm-hmm. But even to this day, I've never had a teacher like some guys have that like guy sure, yeah. or girl that like really like blew their minds mm-hmm. and like I had moments of that, but I've never really connected with a private instructor on a very close level in terms okay. of private lessons. Mm-hmm. I did have band directors, a couple band directors. Um, okay, so you were doing private lessons as well as in school. You had that's exactly music right too. Okay. So private lessons was like after school or on the weekends, right? And then in the school, especially in high school, there was, I mean, I was in every ensemble. I did marching band, jazz band, like percussion ensemble, orchestra. <laughs> like, oh, my God. And throughout nice. that, you they would also kind of have like um, sectionals where you would get just with the drummers. Right, and right, you'd right. have like a teacher teach you certain aspects of it. So, yeah, it was, it was private and school instruction. You must have been known as like the drum guy. I, yeah, I won most system. musical in my senior year. And then oh, year, there but... <laughs> you go. You heard it here first on the Arts Unknown podcast. That's right. Um, nice, cool. So, but you, so you had a good experience overall, but Absolutely. you never had that uh, connection or something in terms of a private teacher, like just okay. strictly a drum set teacher. I right. never got like super close, but there was, you know, other inspirational figures in my musical career that made it an impression on me. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, in terms of just like, it, I know lots of guys have a private instructor that was like, oh my god, right, right. You know, so that's interesting. Did you have? Are these other people, maybe your uh, fellow, not colleagues, what is it in high school, your peers, sure. I guess, yeah, that my... had really good teachers? And then it seems like you're, you had some people that said, oh, I had this guy, and then you're kind of comparing yourself to that. Yeah. I, mine was more like there was like a hand, like one or two or three band directors mm-hmm. that worked for the, the school system. Okay. Some were <laughs> nicer than others, um, mm-hmm. but I mean, they were... Those my high school band directors were very influential on me in terms of pushing me, okay. um, staying on me, making sure I'm practicing, not let me get away with you know 
slacking. Like, exactly. Got it. Okay. So they were, they were more of an influence than my, let's say, like private instructors were. Interesting. Yeah. So a lot of times you feel like it was totally. the opposite. I know. It was very... Because it's the one-on-one time, whereas the school teachers, I imagine, that was in a group setting, right? Yeah, very so. much so. And we had a big music program. I mean, like the marching band, there was over 300 kids in the marching band alone. Like, that's a, wow. that's a big band. So oh it was a very well-attended music program. Yeah. How big was your high school about? We were about 2,000 kids. Wow. Um, maybe a little under. I'm sure it's over that now, but mm-hmm. so it was like, you know, average size. Little, mm-hmm. maybe, now, is that 2,000 kids in the whole high school or per class? Whole high school. So, okay. our class was roughly 500 kids. Okay. You know? Yeah, it seems like about average. Yeah. You know? Totally. I no went to a pretty small high school. I had like 150 kids in my class. Yeah, so. see? That's what's um, Nice. Okay, cool. And, um, any new influences picked up along the way? You started with Zeppelin. You said a lot of rock, a lot of jazz. Sure. Do you remember any uh, discovering any artists or bands when yeah. you were uh, learning and, and taking lessons? Definitely. I mean, yeah, Zeppelin, obviously, for one. But I remember in high school, early high school, that's when I was really getting into, like, not just rock and roll, but, like, jazz music and things. And I remember mm-hmm. just always hearing... When you're a young drum student, you're mm-hmm. just always being pummeled over the head with groove. You got to find your groove. Like, make sure it right. you f- feels good. And, like, when you're a kid, you don't really like, I don't know have what a that groove. means. I'm 14. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, I, I yeah. sound like a 14 year old. Yeah. And I remember it, it's this band. They're still around um, for the most part. They're called Medeski, Martin, and Wood. Okay. Um, Were they of, based out of Ohio? Or? No. They, they actually, most of those guys went to, I think, the New England Conservatory. Okay, um, in Boston? Were, yeah, they're in the Boston area. Mm-hmm. Um, I know they spent some time in New York, but I just remember being like about 14 or 15. Mm-hmm. And the drummer, his name's Billy Martin, t- to this day is still one of my favorite drummers of all time. I remember oh, wow. hearing them playing, and it's this like swampy, jazzy, groovy organ trio. I was going to say, what kind of music do they play? It's 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 kind of, it's like an organ trio, but it's mm-hmm. swampy, it's it's gross, it's, it's <laughs> super groovy. Sometimes they get really weird and out there. Sometimes it's just straight ahead like blues, but mm. it's... It's just wonderful. Nice. And I remember hearing them a song. Wonderfully gross. Yeah, oh, it is. It really is. I remember hearing one of their songs, and I remember just, I I was sitting at my parents' computer, and I just played that song Mm -hmm. over and over. I was like, I get groove. Like I that could, was the light bulb moment. Yeah, okay. it was like, We're oh clicked. my god, man! Like these guys can play. Nice. <laughs> so that was one of the the big ones as a kid. That's you know, I, I still love those guys to this mm-hmm. day. Did uh, you ever play in any bands outside of school? Sure. Yeah. In yeah. high school, in high school, I had my. My rock band Motive. That was Motive. Our, okay. <laughs> we were just like we wanted to be Incubus and Blink One Eighty Two, basically. Okay, just combine uh, that. Uh huh. Got, um, got it. And then yeah, I played in a couple like jazz combo trios in high school, um, nice. and then into college and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's when it, college is when like the band thing really became something I cared about. But okay, and that's a great segue. Thank you for uh, oh, yeah. laying that the groundwork yeah. for me there. <laughs> I was going to transition, but that was perfect. Yeah, sure. Um, so you're getting towards the end of high school and. You're thinking, uh, what do I want to do with my life? Mm-hmm. Uh, college was a thing on your horizon? Very much so. Okay. Um, and pretty much from like once I got into high school, like once mm-hmm. I was in ninth grade or so, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do music. Um, oh, really? That early? Okay. Yeah. And luckily I have still have very supportive and very loving parents and family mm-hmm. and everything. So they were like, yeah, you know, like you have a gift for this. You should, you should you try should do it. Really. Yeah. And it's, you mentioned your uncle too, that was already, he was yeah, also a musician. He was a very big part of it. Um, but yeah, it was just something I knew. I mean, I, I, I was an okay student in high school, mm-hmm. um, but I was obviously, my grades were always really good in music and it was sure. just, it was just self-evident. I'm like, yeah, I have to, I have to do this. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, um, and then what did you think? All right. Did you apply to some places in Ohio or did you yeah. look elsewhere? So or? actually my, the first they actually they weren't even on semesters and uh, the first quarter of my college experience I went to Ohio State okay uh, and I'm not going to say the Ohio State because that drives me nuts I hate when people say people that. say that a lot oh yeah that, that's a thing you say the Ohio, the State, Ohio State that's a pretty big school yeah huge it's a big state okay. school um, so I went there for a quarter and it was just it was kind of a weird experience mm-hmm. um, I don't know in what way I maybe I was given not great advice that I was told the music program was like excellent. Okay. And maybe it is for some things like education or something, but um, I got there and like the facilities were just like really bad. And I, 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 I don't know. It just, it didn't feel right. Mm-hmm. I wasn't like connecting with any of my professors. I was really young and I was already testing into some of the top bands and I was mm-hmm. like, all right, where am I going to grow from here? Right. So that's interesting. It's pretty mature of you to see like 
the trajectory, the future, like, all right, where's my growth potential here? Yeah, and I remember asking, freshmen. like, students and whatever, alumnus and stuff of, like, where, like, what, what do you get? At, like, where do you go from here? Right, right, right. And at the time, you know, I wasn't really interested in teaching. They were just like, yeah, you can go teach it at high school or middle school. And I'm like, man, like, I Music wanna... ed track. Yeah, I was like, no, I don't no. want to do that. So I, I stopped being a music ed major. For, I was a music ed major for like three seconds. Then I just did jazz <laughs> studies. Okay. And then that's when I applied to Berkeley. Um, oh, okay. And like did the audition. And I got in on a little scholarship and I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to Berkeley. Nice, nice. Yeah. What attracted you about Berkeley? Um... I liked so at Ohio State all of the music courses, um, and they might still be. I don't know, but they were. It was very traditional. It was just mm-hmm. like traditional harmony and theory, right? Like classical, very much so. Mm-hmm. It, it was like a, a conservatory sort of vibe. Okay. And I loved how at Berkeley, like at Ohio State, it was like you're either like playing jazz drum set or you're playing like marimba and timpani and like in at the Berkeley, concert band or totally. the symphony, yeah. And at Berkeley, it was like, yeah, there's all these funk ensembles and like you can learn like recording technology and, and all this stuff. It was just. Nice. It aligned with what I thought I wanted at the time better, you know. Okay. Okay. For sure. So you applied, you got in. I applied, got in, and then in January, the January, early January, two thousand seven, I started. Nice. And I graduated two thousand job uh, May twenty ten. May twenty ten. Nice. Yes. Okay. And then what was your uh, degree? Was that drum performance or? I ended up so, and I'm not sure how it works now, but the f- uh, when I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, your first two years, you're kind of like figuring out, you're just going through like the gen eds. So it's, right. you know, you have to do your ensemble classes and lessons and all these things. Sure. And then by your, um, your third year, you're supposed to declare your major. And okay. I ended up going with, um, music production and engineering. Um, okay. they called it like MP and E at the time. I'm not sure if it's still called that, but, mm. um, so like you, everybody there has to play. It's not like you can right. just go there just to record. Right, you so have to be a musician. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. So my first two years were just playing and playing. I was like, man, I want something a little more substantial than just a playing degree. Like mm-hmm. either. So you were already thinking past graduation, like For how sure. am I going to support myself? Yeah, because it's like you don't need a piece of paper to say that you can play. You either can or you can't. You know what I mean? Like, right. So sure. I was like, but you know, I, I might, might as well use a valuable uh, or learn a valuable skill. Skill set, yeah. Sure, and um, use the resources they have there while you're there. Exactly. So mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, I, I'll do the MP&E thing, and mm-hmm. um, it was cool. It was. I say, what was that experience like once you declared that? It was. It's cool. It was. It was cool. It was mm-hmm. very. Um, it's very overwhelming, and it's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we can also get into this too later mm-hmm. or now, whenever it is. It's. They set up all these expectations or like you're, you're doing all of this stuff on this crazy expensive gear and they're teaching you all these sure. techniques and things that doesn't necessarily align with the job market after you graduate I see, I see. college. Okay. So you're, you're learning on these like, like Neve consoles that are in like right. these million dollar studios when in reality, like this little interface we have right here right. in the room. <laughs> a little focus, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the majority of what people are recording on now. Sure, you know what I mean? Sure. You know, obviously it varies, but right, right. So it was interesting. It was, okay, it was cool. I learned mm-hmm. a lot about you know acoustics and microphones and and signal flow and and you know that all was yes that was all very helpful. But in terms of like when am I ever going to be on like a you know SSL console again in my life? Right, unless exactly. I'm working at like Blackbird Studio. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So, so a little bit unrealistic expectations. I would say so. Now, did you realize that at the time when you were using these, like, wow, this is amazing. I'm never going to get a chance to use these again. Or was it? Later, after you graduated, when you got out into the real world, be like, wait a minute, there's no Neve consoles everywhere. And- it, it was it was definitely more towards at least the end of the of the degree, and then in the real world after that became okay. very obvious. Where it was just like, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff I learned was still like, you know, an ox end is an ox end on whatever you're using, right? But it the caliber of gear uh, was definitely more apparent mm. apparent after I graduated. Where I was just like, wow, like why? Why did they teach us? <laughs> like, right, right. I, I don't know. And that's, just, you know, it's just my experience. There's plenty sure, of guys sure. I know that do still work on those things. And that was all very valid. And, and Right, right. It really depends. Case by case basis. And then how was your, uh, I assume you took private lessons. In college, there. yeah. Yeah, yeah. How was your experience being a student at the college level? Private lessons and, and otherwise in group classes as well. Sure. Um, same kind of thing. It's like I had some teachers that were cool that like gave me some, some good advice. And I... Mm-hmm. It's not like I didn't learn anything from that sure, or whatever, sure. but I again I never had the like that 
guy, you know, my, mm-hmm. the guru, sure. you know <laughs> yeah, what I yeah. mean? That I like, like I didn't have my own personal Yoda. That's some of my mm-hmm. that's buddies. A good, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, it, whatever. I learned some, some really interesting things. The ensembles mm-hmm. were cool, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, yeah. But, what kind of ensembles were you in? I don't, man, I don't even you remember. <laughs> I, I remember one semester I wasted a semester doing this like hand percussion, like, uh, course where I was just playing like congas to like. I was playing <laughs> like merengue and mambos mm-hmm. and all these things. And I'm like, dude, I don't play Latin jazz. Like, what am right. I doing? I got more out of the peers, the kids that I met there. Mm. And the also connections you made. the connections. And like, I learned more. I was also, while I was in school, I was playing in my original band. Um, we okay. Were, we were called King Orchid. Okay. And it was like this weird, like. So motive broke up. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Shortly after we formed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I just personally, me, I found I got more out of playing and writing when, in my weird little rock band and then eventually doing some regional touring than I mm-hmm. did out of just sitting in a room learning with a private instructor. Got it. Okay. Um, so you were the kind of kid that wanted to get out there and do it. And absolutely. Pound the pavement, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, not like there was plenty of cats at Berkeley that were like, you sit in a closet for eight hours and practice and shed and shed and like that's great. Like there, mm-hmm. you could get very good that way. I just didn't and don't work mm-hmm. that way. I was like, sure. I just want to go play and tour. And yeah. So now, did any of the the teachers, uh, private lesson or group class, uh, give you any sort of instruction on hey, so once you get out, this is how you're gonna support yourself and these are the different careers you go. Not really. I Not mean, really. they there was a couple. You know, conversations here and there of like, hey, kid, it's going to be really hard out there. Like, you know. <laughs> right, right. Do you know how to make eggs? Because that seems the burgers? theme is like, okay, everyone is usually more of a warning than advice. It's like, hey, you're a musician. Good luck. As opposed totally. to, hey, you're a musician. Here's some options and here's yes. what you could do. Yes. And there, there mm-hmm. definitely was like, you're, you're probably going to have to supplement your income for a long time. Like, not just playing drums. Like, what right. else can you do? You know? Right, right. Um, and that became... Very apparent once I graduated, I was like, "Oh yeah, they were right." Like, yeah. I, I have to go. <laughs> I was going to ask how quickly after you graduated was it the uh, "Oh my god" moment? Like, oh, what do I, I do? It was even beforehand. You know, yeah. was, I was touring my weird little band. I didn't have mm-hmm. any money. I was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting tables. I'm mm-hmm. delivering sushi on a bike in Boston." Oh man, <laughs> you know, it's you like, go. yeah, you just you needed another job. Yeah, yeah, because there's not a lot of jobs out there. Sure, yeah, sure. For Let's talk about that band a little bit. You said you went on tour mm-hmm. with them. Yeah. What so was that experience like? It it still to this day is one of the most beautiful times of my life. I mean, really? it, it was okay. part of it was hard because um like I mentioned previously, I was like, you know, waiting tables and I was dirt sure. poor and I didn't have a car. I was riding my bike 12 months out of the year in Boston, right? right? And it was oh, geez. But the touring was wonderful. It was with mm-hmm. one of my dearest friends still to this day. Mm-hmm. His name is Doug Wartman. Hi, Doug, if you're listening. Hi, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, it was just a, it was a two piece. It was just the two okay. of us, and we we lived. Oh wow, okay. Yeah. What did he play? He played guitar, but guitar. he had like a, a couple pedal boards that were like the size of this room, and we oh, did all God. sorts of looping and distortion. Oh and wow, it was a okay. lot of fun. Did but you guys was, get compared to the White Stripes or the Black Keys yeah, at all? Yeah, but we were like way weirder. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say, it sounds weirder. It doesn't sound as much like back to basics. I think yeah. those bands are more like keeping it simple, sure. nice bluesy riffs. And we and, both idolized those bands and mm-hmm. still do to some extent. But um, How did the idea come about to do a, a duo? Was it more of like, hey, we like playing together. Let's see what we can do with these minimal instruments. Or was there some other reason? Um, that's a good question. It was more like... He and I were became best friends quickly, and mm-hmm. we had this really good chemistry personally and musically. Mm-hmm. And we tried a couple of different things. Like we tried playing with a cellist at one point. We tried oh, wow. maybe like tossed around the idea of just bringing other people in. Mm-hmm. And the music we were writing and playing was very complicated, very like oh, really? odd okay. time signatures. Yeah, I was, was going to say what kind of style. It was like we always just it, we said it was loud, fun, experimental rock. I mean, it, okay. it was riffy and loopy mm-hmm. and whatever, but. It just, it was, we were like, man, why, like, ruin a good thing? Let's just keep it too people. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> so we just did that. But the, the touring was great. Like, we just mm-hmm. went all over the country and... and wow. Okay. Um, what played... was that like? How did you set that up? Did you, was there any blueprint for, here's how to tour? Because I feel like <laughs> most people kind of figure it out as they go. Right. It, um, there was a website at the time. Um, oh, man, what 
was it called? I'm going to blank on the name now that I need to think about it. Um, like how to tour for dummies. Kind, kind of, of but it was like they gave you all the venues and the contact information. Really? And, um, Who yeah. put that together? That's amazing. It was great. And we basically just booked our own tours. And we had other friends okay. and bands that were touring in this like little Boston rock scene mm-hmm. that had done it um, before us. And like, uh, try calling this venue and talk mm-hmm. to this guy. And we just, we, we would piece together these one to three, three and a half week tours. Okay. And like we played South by Southwest in Austin a couple of years. And like nice. we would just kind of play up and down the East Coast into the mm-hmm. Midwest and a little of the South. Mm-hmm. But it, it was great. You know, it was like yeah, we were broken. Yeah, but we were playing music and it was awesome. And and you guys were doing all the booking and all the calling and all that Absolutely, kind of stuff. Yeah, we didn't have a, a label. No manager or no, anything like that. No, or... not at all. There was like this little rock scene in Boston that kind of called themselves like the Half Pint Collective. And it was us <laughs> and a, a handful name. of other bands. Yeah, and we would like kind of support each other on tour and locally mm-hmm. and help I would each say, other did you out. ever tour with any other of those bands? Absolutely. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, how does that work? How did you, how did you organize that? Uh, just over beers at somebody's house. You know, like <laughs> Hence I, the name, the half pint. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And and like Doug and I, we were a two piece, but we also got uh, we were brought into this other band mm. um, to be like the rhythm section because their drummer okay. and bass player left. Okay. So we just kind of a lot of cross pollination. Yeah, going it was on. very in, uh, ancestral <laughs> sort of. <laughs> music That's one way to put it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Uh, I was thinking about the the manager thing or lack thereof. Mm-hmm. For any uh, one that's listening that is in a band or is solo artist or whatever, would you say it's it's a good idea to try to get someone to help you out? You know, whether their title's a manager or whatnot it doesn't really matter. But or uh, would you say just go out and do it yourself and figure it out as you go along? I, it's uh, kind of a bit of both. Like it okay. was one, like re- just really good lessons learned booking this on your own and learning how hard it is and like right. piecing together tours and trying to get paid and trying mm-hmm. to get enough gas money, you know, like, sure. but if you can afford it, I'd say the first thing to get would be like a, a booking agent. Um, okay. Sure. Yeah. Cause that's the hardest thing to do when you're on your own. I mean now, especially nowadays you can record a record in like somebody's mom's basement, you know, right, and right. it'll sound okay. Yeah. So like you can do a lot of stuff on your own now. Booking is definitely hard, especially when you're first starting out. Right. Um, you're trying to focus on the music, I would imagine, and that's kind of a distraction almost. Yeah, totally. And just other aspects of, you know, at the end of the day, it is a business if you're trying to make money at it. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's hard to do. It's hard to keep all those balls in the air being juggled. Sure. Yeah, um, I was going to say, what was the most difficult or your least favorite thing about touring? And what was uh, maybe one of the easier and one of your favorite things about touring? <clears throat> you could think of those two extremes sure um at least that kind of touring when we were just like in a small little car um because we haven't even gotten to nashville touring and we'll get there but yeah (laughs) um the honestly the hardest part is and that kind of goes for touring really anyways but Mm -hmm. the lack of sleep like you you don't eat well you don't Mm -hmm. have like almost any personal space especially when you're in a two-piece band in a volkswagen gti yeah (laughs) driving to new orleans from boston you get to know your buddy pretty well oh yeah yeah and lucky for you know my bandmate and i we're very close but Mm -hmm. um so that's that's the hardest part is just Mm -hmm. the lack of personal space you know and Mm -hmm. nutrition (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh but yeah i mean the best part was Especially when you're young, you know, and you mm-hmm. have, don't have responsibilities, it was like I, we're seeing a new, we're playing music in a new city every night, and wow, like seeing the country, you mm-hmm. know, it must and, be incredible. It is, especially when you've never done it before. You know, mm-hmm. that def, like everything else, you do too much, it gets old. But right, um, but that first time, that first tour, first two or three, you know, you're just like, wow, man, like we're doing it. <laughs> this, That's great. This is really cool. Now, how did you get people to turn out for the shows? Was it one of those things where it's like a bunch of different bands, or because that would be my, you know, if I was a young artist right now or uh, in a band or something like that, it's like, all right, the main thing is how do we get people to come out in sure. a place that you've never been before and people have never heard of you before, right? Um, it all starts, or rather it should start locally or regionally. Mm -hmm. And that, that model will go towards when you start touring too, Mm -hmm. you want to start just as an opener and hopefully for a band that can draw more than three people, Right. you get your opening slot and it's just Mm -hmm. like anything else. You, you hopefully you play well and the word of mouth and you, you get booked on another bill with like a bigger band. And then maybe you start, you move up now you're direct support instead of opener. Right. And then locally, hopefully over time, Mm -hmm. you're headlining shows and then people are coming to your shows and you're paying it forward, helping. Right, right, right. So the cycle continues there. Yes. Once you get a little bit higher on the the ladder there, you can help 
a younger band or a younger but artist. But it's it's more important or more. Uh, uh, it makes a bigger difference when you're on tour to get booked with somebody that has a draw because in your mm-hmm. local in your the town you're from, you mm-hmm. can always have your buddies show up or you know your mom, you know, right, like, right, your family, they or can whoever. fill a room. Yes, yeah, yeah. like so when you're touring, that's the biggest thing is make sure you you book yourself not just like as an opener, but as an opener for somebody that can draw. Right. And can see you and like you can sell merch and you can maybe sell a record. Like Right, right, right. But it's just it's just that, you know. Mm-hmm. Nowadays with all social media media and stuff, it's probably a different ball game. Right now, when you guys were doing this, was social media still like a new thing? Totally. Yeah. yeah. This was like two thousand um eight, nine, ten. Okay. And, so and Facebook was around. It was around, but like, you know, there wasn't like all of the like how important Instagram is now to like right. artists and, and everyone's a marketing expert now. Exactly. This is how you're supposed to do it. And how yeah. many times a day are you supposed to post and that we were st- everyone's still around. figuring it out back then. You right. know, it was like Was MySpace still a thing? Totally. I remember yeah. when we first started we had a MySpace. Page. Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So you laugh a, now, people, but yeah, it was a back thing. in the day that was legit. Oh yeah. Yeah, I remember once uh, when I was doing my own kind of music thing and uh, someone, I said, oh, I have a music Facebook page. They're like, well, you know, you really should get something serious like a MySpace page. Like, (laughs) Facebook's okay, but like, you want, if you want to take yourself seriously, get MySpace. And now it's like how the tables have turned. Right, exactly. Um, Wow, okay. So you guys were just, did you really utilize any social media stuff or was it more, how did you promote yourself, I guess? We tried. I mean, we did, we put some videos and things on YouTube of like, tour right. videos and stuff but no i mean honestly for the most part it was it was play the show and we had a really nice merch set up with like, like all these vintage okay. suitcases and lights and oh, things. Wow. but we were doing it old school we had, well mm-hmm. relatively old school we had an emailing list mm-hmm. and we would play our show we'd be like hey we'll see you guys at the merch table sign up right. if you dig it if not that's cool see you later right right, right. and we would write everyone's email down mm-hmm. that night or the next morning in the hotel or the van or whatever you yep. put in all the email lists and got it send it out so it wasn't mm-hmm. and that was like keeping tabs on the tour like hey guys this is what we're up yeah, to we're like maybe you a know, new song coming out new album totally that's exactly right nice yeah just doing it ourselves that's great right. and did you get uh a lot of people to sign up was that a successful model that you found uh, relatively, relatively yeah i mean we never got big nationally or anything but like mm-hmm. in our our little world in boston mm-hmm. like um when we were leaving we 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 had like a farewell residency at oh, wow. um, this rock club in in alston it's called o'brien's it's still there mm-hmm. um and it was cool. We like sold it out every night, every Saturday for a month straight. You know, That's and it was great. like fans showed up to like sh- show us off. You mm-hmm. know, or you know, be like thanks for all the years. And sure, sure. So that was that was cool. It was very rewarding. You That's know? great to hear from a for a duo with a bunch of loops and yeah. stuff like that too. You know, <laughs> yeah, um, it was nice. Cool. So how long did you do that for? How long was that a thing? That was probably about four and a half years. Okay, four and a half, five years. And this did this start when you were in college, and then kind yeah. of led into the real world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. we, we met in in school, and then yeah, toured for like a year or two after, and mm-hmm. then around twenty thirteen. Mm-hmm. I, I moved to Baltimore for a quick two years working for this production company. We weren't even going to talk about it. It was awful. Okay. <laughs> it was just like a, just like this. <laughs> skip right over that. Part yeah, of your life. I, I I figured out I didn't really belong in corporate America. Mm-hmm. We'll just put it that way. Yeah. And then I yeah, then I moved to Nashville. And you moved to Nashville. Mm-hmm. Okay. From Baltimore, or did you move back to Boston? No, Boston, Baltimore, Nashville. Okay. Right in a row. And let's start there. How how did you end up moving to Nashville? So a lot of my buddies from college, mm-hmm. with, with, gra- like uh, Berkeley buddies, yep. graduated and moved there. Okay. Some of my dearest friends, uh, mm-hmm. and they were like. Hey man, like, what are you doing? Like, come to Nashville. Like, you can make a career. <laughs> really? Okay. So they drums. said, "Hey, you can make a yeah, career." Yeah, because like, like a bunch of them were already like either touring or doing, mm-hmm. you know, like production stuff and making mm-hmm. good money. And they yep. were like, well, "When you say production stuff, what do you mean exactly?" Uh, like? A couple Being buddies, a producer. Of, yeah, a couple buddies of mine were in the studio world. A couple mm-hmm. of them were doing um, live front of house, like touring, doing okay. like okay. sound for bands. Yep. Uh, but, the, you know, like a lot of it was like at the tour bus level, you know, and I was right. like, oh, wow, cool. You know, I want to do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they were just encouraging. And I was like, and yeah. you were hating your life in Baltimore, yeah. that job. <laughs> Which so is easy like, to do. Right. <laughs> no offense, Baltimore. No, it's all good. Uh, and then, not, not a knock on the city, just right. on the job. Exactly. So, okay. Yeah, and, and then you said, okay, that sounds like a deal. And I went, yeah. And uh, it was great. Okay. Uh, I mean. So what did you do once you got there? Was there gigs immediately or like you no. have to establish God, yourself no. <laughs> <laughs> you think it is when you're right. moving there you're like oh i have all these friends i'll be touring tomorrow and it's like no right no uh and it's you know just like any anybody else thinking about being in music you're gonna have to do some 
gigs you don't like, either musically or otherwise. I mean, mm-hmm. it was a lot of, I was, I was flipping eggs. I delivered flowers. I mean, oh, like wow, okay. I did all sorts of stuff. And then mm-hmm. I, that's when I got into doing live sound because I could um, kind of be in the music scene. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you said you had a lot of experience with that at college, yes. too. So. Um, but that was mostly studio stuff. So that I had never really oh, done right, too right, much right. Okay. live sound. Mm-hmm. sound. Um, so yeah, I moved there and like I just started, you know, networking with people. Luckily, mm-hmm. I had well-connected friends that were the reason I was there, and they, they right that always helps accelerated it. Yeah, right. So that's another thing, uh, you know, just for anyone listening, as far as being a musician or anything in the arts is uh, having those connections. That seems like that really speeds up the process as far as very much finding so. a way to support yourself. Yes, and I, you know, say this with full confidence i have the best friends in the world and they all you know care about me very much and i do too so mm-hmm. they were always looking out for me and if, they, if somebody needed a drummer like oh get my buddy zach on there and right it's just like anything else you know you start doing that somebody hears you like oh this cat can play let's get him on another gig and mm-hmm. you know you just kind of just the snowball effect yeah you figure it out nice how long did it take before uh things really started picking up like were you able to quit the Flipping eggs yeah. and delivering flowers <laughs> job eventually? Yeah, I was. Um, I It was probably like a couple years into it where it was like, okay, like I have a relatively steady gig. I would still have to supplement my income doing other things, mm-hmm. but it was like, no, like I'm I'm playing drums every week, every weekend, or like okay. I'm on the road for three, four days every was, week, every other week. Was that a one band or one group, or was that just enough stuff that it kind of all added up to... At Something first, substantial. It, yeah, that's a good question. At, at first, it was just kind of one-offs, just like sure. this artist needs a guy for a gig or two, and then they're like, okay, did that, move on to the next one. Right, right. And then the more I was around, I started to play with a certain artist for like a few months, and then it would be like a year or something, right. you know what I mean, mm-hmm. and, and become a little more steady. Got it. Um, but yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. either way, I was a hired gun. You know, sure, that's sure. kind of the, the thing. What was that experience like, having to jump into a lot of different roles? It was really intense, especially at first, because up until then, like when you get to Nashville, mm-hmm. everybody can play for right. the most part. I mean, mm-hmm. every it's like it was like me going from high school to Berkeley. It's like you you think you're a big deal, and right. then you get to Berkeley, and you're like, wow, I'm terrible. This right, is... <laughs> right. So um, in in Nashville that process was crazy because I would have to jump in and you're expected to learn two hours of music Mm -hmm. by like, you know, a day from now. Right. So that's when writing charts for myself became very um, useful. And I was taught how to do that by some of my drummer friends that had already been doing it. And so it's just, you got to be good and you got to be quick. And that was like, it was, it was really intense. Time was of the essence there for sure. Very much so. Yeah. Okay. So that was that was something else. Nice. And then eventually it turned into something where it wasn't a one-off thing. You had a, a more steady gig. Yeah. I started playing for a few artists. Um, and then I was playing for this artist, Eric Van Houten, for a while. And then um, I got, for the last like two, two and a half years I was there, I played for this artist named Josh Phillips, a uh, country artist. And we, we did some of like a bunch of headlining shows, but we also were on tour with like bigger country artists Mm -hmm. uh, like Luke Combs and Brantley Gilbert and all these things. Mm -hmm. And, but it was, that was my gig. I like very rarely would take like a little side thing. It was like, I was exclusively playing for this artist. It's still all just like a handshake deal. Right. Right. Um, It's not written down on paper. It's kind of an understood. Yeah. And that's how that, all of that works for the most part. I was going to ask, is that typical? Very much so. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a strange relationship as a hired gun, especially mm. when you're with a band or an artist for a while, mm. because you're you, you're their employee at, right. in some respects, but like you're on the road with these people and you're eating and drinking together and right. sharing you're hotel rooms. To know them. You become very close very quick. Right. So like the lines of friendship and business can get blurred and things. Sure, but sure. but still, it's it's all. You never sign a contract, you know. It's just really like, okay. Yeah, it's just uh, that's surprising to me. I feel like once at, the, at a certain level, it might be like, okay, we need to write this down so everyone's on the same page. And for the like big guys, you know, <clears throat> the ones that are selling, you know, millions of right. records, I'm sure stadiums, and yeah, stuff like that. that is different because people get salaried and you know, there's all sure. these sure, yeah, yeah, things. But for the, where I was, mm-hmm. you know, it was 
and where the vast majority are, it's much more casual and just an understood agreement. Like, yeah, you're you're my drummer. Don't screw me over. <laughs> like, right. Please, don't leave yeah. tomorrow. You know. Right. Because I imagine if that happens too, you know, you've talked about how important the network is and your friend group is. If you were to do something bad like that, oh. you have a black mark on you. Like, and oh, I've that's seen the drummer. It happen. Who did it. You have absolutely okay. where it's just like, yeah, man, that guy can play, but whatever. He's really picky. He's really finicky on the road, or like, oh, he's a great player, but he. He never showers, you know, like, or he's always <laughs> wow. late. It's like, yeah, really flaky or something like that. Yeah, they they call Nashville the little big town, you know, and that's that's the a band, but it's also, right, right. Uh, it's true. It's it's this huge music industry, but it's like a, this very finite amount of people that everybody knows each other. Right. You see each other on the road, you're like, oh, hey, man. So, so it's a tight knit group of people. Yeah, so you only get so many strikes before sure. where it starts going around, you know. Right, right. Did you like that kind of an environment? Because it seems like Boston and maybe Ohio was like that for you as well, kind of that. You know, you had your network. It was kind of a small town in some yeah, ways. I did like it. Um, just like some things, it, it got to be a little clicky sometimes, and you okay. would see like the that. But I, I didn't. I didn't really pay attention to any all to, to any of that really. I, mm-hmm. I I liked it. It's a very social town. You know, mm-hmm. you, you get to know everyone, and um, mm-hmm. and is there a lot of other stuff besides country? Because I feel like Nashville kind of gets stereotyped as oh, that's a country music town. But I've heard in more recent years, it's more. Diverse is that your Very experience? So. Yeah, country is still king. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so like that makes sense. Yeah, and that's the history is there. It is in the industry. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like all of the most of the publishing deals are p- people are writing country songs. You know, right. mo- you know, most of the record deals are country artists. It's, right. it's still country is still king there. But mm-hmm. like I played in like kind of like a punk rock band there, and I, when I was a front of house engineer, I saw everything. I saw hip hop. I saw Oh, wow. Like rock, there's a, a decent metal scene there. Um, lot, lots of pop music. So yeah, I mean, it's it's Music City. Country is still king, but it is definitely Music City for a reason. There's a lot going on there. Nice, nice. Yeah. And uh, and how long did you play with that band for? I was with Josh um, for about two, a little over two years. Like in between two, two and a half years. Mm-hmm. Um, up until when my, my fiance and I, who I met in Nashville, mm-hmm. we just moved back to Massachusetts recently. Oh, nice. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, I was with Josh for the the last uh, yeah like two and a half years or so. How do you take it when you had to leave? Is that a <laughs> tough thing to be like, hey, buddy, uh, man? I want to let you know. No, he he still to this day is a very dear friend of mine, uh, and I I quit or quit. Mm-hmm. I stopped touring because I am getting married, and I didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, my fiance and I want to start a family and things, and mm-hmm. I didn't want to be trying to raise a family on the road when I'm gone all the time and none sure. of our families live there. Okay. So I told Josh all of this and he was like, yeah, dude, I get it, man. Like, that's great. Yeah. yeah. You know, like he had a kid, he understands so mm-hmm. it was, no, it was, it was great. Nice. Yes. That's great. And that more or less brings us up to present day. Yeah. Nice. So what are you doing now? What are your activities music wise? Man, I'm figuring that all out. You know, yep. it's like, I'm, I'm playing with a dear friend of mine, Tony Rosado, who's, Part of the um, Creative Peaks. Yep, thing. yep. He's a previous podcast guest That's as right. well. Um, playing with him, some of my college buddies are still here. So, like, mm-hmm. you know, I've been hitting them right, up right. about playing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start teaching and get back into actually like teaching privately or maybe even publicly. And uh, okay, but you know, it's one of those things I have to I have to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I will. So nice, yeah. nice. And that also seems a theme as as far as musicians goes. Is you just. You got to keep figuring out. You don't want to stop. Absolutely. It's kind of like the what's the thing about the shark? If a shark stops swimming, it dies. Right. Would that be a, a appropriate metaphor yeah. for this kind of situation? Very much so. And it's you know, one of the things I was told when I was a little kid, getting into music that I didn't really understand until I got older and really experienced it was being a musician isn't a job. It's not a career. It's a lifestyle. It's everything mm-hmm. around it. Yeah. It's, and I still feel that way about it. It's, it's not mm-hmm. something. It's like what you do for fun. It's what you do when you're sad. It's what you do when you're bored. It's like right, right. it's it's everything. So right. I have to do it. It's there's no other option. Right, you right, know right. I mean? And I, I've heard that from a lot of different musicians and artists as well. Right. Um, just in general. Um, if anyone wants to listen to anything that you've done, do you have any music online from any of your previous bands? Um, yeah, um, all of King Orchid's stuff is probably probably still on uh, Spotify and Apple Music. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I was in a band in Nashville. Uh, they're still playing. They're called Have a Rad Day. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, they, they have like an EP out that I was on. Uh, mm-hmm. I played on a record by a band in Nash or at uh, Boston called Dirty Dishes. Uh, mm-hmm. The record's called Guilty. I was on some of those tracks. Sounds like you got a lot of different stuff in a lot of different places you're on. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Nice. Um, I could see. Is that something you'd like to do? As as far as like, oh, kind of hopping from project to project as opposed to sticking with one group for a while sure yeah Yeah. i mean yeah i did a little bit of session work when i was in nashville and i always found that very satisfying to just Mm. like yeah like we're gonna we're gonna do this song today and then you know the next time i'm in the studio it's like a you know completely different scenario yeah like a bluegrass song you know and now now we're doing like whatever metal you know you like the challenge of that kind of having to shift into different roles yeah if i can do it (laughs) right i can't play everything but that's all good yeah we're only human right yes exactly um Nice. Well, that that's pretty much all I had to, uh, that I wanted to talk to you about today. I guess I always just like to wrap up with, uh, you know, what advice would you give young artists and musicians who want to make a living in those fields, whether they're, you know, uh, elementary school, high school, or yeah. adults? Um, uh, just based on all your incredible experience there, what, what kind of advice would you give if someone came to you and said, "Hey, I want to be a musician. Right. What should I do?" <laughs> sure. Um, I know it's very open ended, but no, but that that's it's an important thing to ask, especially when you're young, thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say be patient. Um, make sure mm-hmm. you do practice, but I would say more important than practice, make sure you go and play, play live in front of people. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how you're going to get better is learning how to how an audience reacts, what works, what doesn't work. Sure, um, sure, and that's something I haven't actually talked about too much on this podcast. You want to speak to that a little bit as far as audience? Oh. Yeah, their reaction or or <laughs> lack of reaction. Yeah, I, and that's the other thing. Like that goes back into being patient because mm. you're gonna have nights where you're killing it and everybody's loving it, and then you'll play the next city the next night, and it's like as if nobody's even in the room listening to you, and you're like, "What did we do different?" Right. So it's okay. You're gonna screw up. You're right. gonna have terrible nights. You're mm-hmm. gonna have great nights. Um, mm-hmm. I've had nights where I've played in front of. 10 people mm-hmm. and it was one of the best shows of my life and I've had nights where I've played in front of 30,000 people and it right. was awful you know? wow. and you're like so it's it doesn't it's not the the size it's it's how you go about the show and if right. it doesn't go well that's okay mm-hmm. there's always a next night right um so yeah I guess that's goes into being patient just mm-hmm. don't you know It'll be okay. Right, right. Don't uh, jump to conclusions too quickly just because you have one bad show. Yes, like, that's oh, exactly right. Because uh, I've seen people, they get in their own head about things. And sure. Like, well, oh. I, can, I can imagine it's tough for the self-esteem. Sure. You know, if you have a few bad shows in a row, it's like, should I be doing this? Maybe I should quit music. Right. That's an easy, that's a slippery slope, I imagine. Yes, it very much is. You just got to kind of like, you know, like if, if a quarterback gets sacked, you can't just play the rest of the game. You're like, oh, I just got sacked. It's like, all right, next play. All right. Right, it's right. Okay. Got to keep, keep going moving. here. Got to keep moving. Was there anything you did to help you not kind of get trapped in that mode of thinking when you had a bad show? Yeah, totally. Um, I, I would try and think, what did I do wrong? And if I realized I didn't do anything wrong, which th- was rare, but I was like, mm-hmm. hey, you know what? I did my best. Mm-hmm. I was like really trying hard out there. And they sometimes audiences just aren't into it and there's nothing you can do. They're Either they're too drunk, they're, yep. it's not their their genre of music. Right. You just got to be like, you know what? Whatever. That, it's that out of your that. control sometimes. Yeah. And that's okay. And like just... All you can do is just be, show up to the gig prepared. Right. <laughs> like, do, do your, your part. Yes. Yep. And you'll keep getting called and you'll have good shows. It's, that's, that's okay. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap it up. Thank you, Zach, cool. so much for coming Dude, on the podcast. You. I appreciate it, man. Really appreciate it. Shake hands, even though it's yes. a podcast, no one can yeah, see that. But that's that. okay. <laughs> Take our word for it. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for being on the show. And uh, everyone who's listening at home, thanks so much for listening. My name is Jared Rocco, and you have been listening to the Arts Unknown podcast. See you next time. All right, that's it for today's episode of the Arts Unknown podcast. I'd like to say a special thank you to my guest today, Zach Fearman, for coming on the show and sharing his stories. If you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Arts Unknown podcast, consider subscribing to the show. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. I'm also happy to announce that we now have a YouTube channel where you can find all of our latest episodes. We'd also love to hear your thoughts on the show, so leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher to let us know how we're doing. My name is Jared Rocco, and I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening.